confess you that I'm in a big, big trouble. It has nothing to do with my TED presentation. So basically, what, what happened, the key things for any presentation is to rehearse. And so I did it, and I did it yesterday, and my rehearsal was 38 minutes. <laughs> now, there's a golden rule in TED, which is your presentation is to stay in 80 minutes. And in order to remind us, we have this little nice iPad here that tells me that I've been talking for 30 seconds already. So, that was a bad rehearsal, and I need to rehearse again this morning. But tonight, I have a restaurant with a single table, and in this table there are 30 people coming, and I need to prepare the sauce for my cannelloni. And so, I rehearsed while the sauce was, was on the fire, with a timer of my iPhone, and stopping every now and then to, make the, to have the sauce, the, 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 yeah, you, you got the idea. <laughs> like, what, what I was rehearsing. So, I got excited uh, about that because I'm truly passionate about the trip I did in, in Patagonia. And then it was already 11.30 and I was told I need to be here by 12. And so, I rushed out of the home and I took my Vespa and, and drive and I was thinking about what to say. And then I realized, shit, the sauce. <laughs> so, I left uh, the sauce uh, on the fire. Oh, no. Yeah. And so I, I called someone to say, please go there to switch their sauce off. But I haven't heard from this person. Now, I know a few of you have arrived in the second session. So please do tell me if you see any fire trucks or if you're checking in the news and there's a big fire in, in Aberdeen. Please let me know because I'm very nervous about what's happening there. Which has probably relaxed me about the presentation we were talking about. <laughs> So hopefully I will stay in these 18 minutes. So uh, to, um, we, we heard about uh, book sketches in, in the first presentation, in the first presentation, as well as uh, histograms. Uh, I believe in the power of books to enhance uh, our travel experiences. And uh, modern traveling has become stressful. We have a lot of choices, as we have seen. We travel without purpose. And basically, we travel just because we have the money to. We travel not to see something new. We travel to escape a routine and a daily life that is taking all the energy away from us. It's becoming frustrating because a key aspect of traveling is the ability to appreciate what you saw. But the problem is, the bad news, is that you can't appreciate on the spot, right there. Hence, the ability to grasp the meaning that we really seek to bring into our life, and hence, uh, the frustrations. But books, books are powerful. They are really powerful, I believe, because, first of all, it helps you to appreciate things, to grow interest in something, to maybe even become passionate about uh, um, a, a piece of architecture uh, or, a, or, a, or a painting uh, or a natural features uh, or a local culture. We all read and when we read we we'll cry and we laugh and that means we, emphasize, we emphasize with uh, empathize, sorry. We empathize with uh, the people that we're going to meet or we empathize about places. And that is very powerful because it's all about connecting. And when you can connect, you can experience. And this is a key word. And I think that almost every speaker before me has talked about experiences in some way. Because when you experience, that is fulfilling. And you enter a space where everything becomes possible. Your perception is open. And this is the magic of travel. And so I want to spend the next 16 minutes, <laughs> telling a little bit about those books. I went to uh, Patagonia on an adventure expedition in, uh, in December last year, and I stayed there for two months. And these are the books that kept company for the previous 16 months. And what I want to share with you is that how those have informed uh, my travel and bring a little bit of meaning into it. This man, this Portuguese uh, man, was a key um, character and author in my, in my reading. Ferdinand Magellan, 
a Portuguese who managed to convince the King of Spain to finance a crazy expedition. The expedition to find a passage in the newly discovered America and to go around the world. And if you read about his story, which is remarkable how he put, not just the fact that he circumnavigated the globe, but how he came into it, you really get passion about what other explorers were doing at the time. In those years, the first part of 1500 were really remor remarkable times. Man discovered for the first time in the history of man being, in only 50 years, the earth as we know it. This is a map of uh, 1490, so two, uh, few years before the discovery of America. And this is what we know about the world. So we have a fairly good idea about Europe. We have been a little bit in the west coast of Africa, never, ne never touched the east one, and we thought this other continent, Asia, a huge bulk piece of land that, that nobody knew and everybody was afraid about. Uh, 20 years later, only 20 years later, there we go. We, uh, Africa was fully explored. Asia started to take the shape that it has, and a new continent appeared. And after 20 years after that, there it is, the world that we know now, in only one generation. And uh, at this point, I have to apologize for if there is any Australian in the Mediterranean in the, in the Yeah, Australia is not on the map. <laughs> And, 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 and uh, some Australian friends also complain that it's still not on the map. <laughs> but that's, uh, that is a, a totally, uh, it's, it's totally another story. Uh, so this generation really went out and reading, uh, reading these books about these uh, seafarers, uh, about these, uh, uh, these adventure is uh, really, really exciting because they were crazy. They went on with very literal instruments. So one of these is this instrument, which actually is just a piece of wood together. They call it the charcoal sticks. And, uh, and first of all, it's not just that it's uh, totally well, quite inaccurate, but also it's the fact that he measure position by looking at the sun and measuring the angle that he has, that, that, it, that it creates. And the problem of looking into the sun is that you get blind. <laughs> so, your navigator in the middle of the ocean gets blind, and it's kind of different to find a turn huh? <laughs> to, 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 take, to, to take his place. But, and uh, it was also about uh, to really face great dangers and great perils. And one was the, the tempest and the violence of the sea. Another one, the monster, the million monster that inhabited the seas, uh, probably the seas uh, of our minds. There were pirates with a smoky bear that were ready to take all your gold and your life. And then there were naked virgin trying to lure you. So, well, I see some minds uh, wondering why that is a problem. <laughs> but if you look at here, you, you see these uh, men, uh, after seeing the, the naked virgins, uh, they're familiar to anyone. <laughs> um, so, with the passion got, uh, it's not just anymore, okay, let's go and check out Patagonia. With the passion that all the reading about this voyage uh, gave me, me and my wife set off for Patagonia for a very specific adventure that was uh, uh, tied to the end of the world and back. But, uh, and we, but we constructed uh, a larger uh, trip into it in order to go to check out the places that we read about, try to find some of their characters, and reenact some, uh, some of those voyages. Uh, so we took a car and that uh, to, to drive all the way from north to south, and then from south, north back again, and if someone uh, differently than me, know something about car, you know that this is not a good car to go on on an unpaved uh, road, particularly if an Italian is driving. <laughs> we went to national parks and we went running on uh, trails, and then finally we went off trail and did our own, uh, and in the, did our own little adventure uh, that I'm going to talk a little bit about. But the core, the real core of the trips were two channels of water that connects 
the Atlantic with the Pacific. The North one is El Paso, is a Magellan voyage. And that was revolutionary because it changed totally every concept of theology, cosmology, geography. And the southern one is the Beagle Channel. And another character of my readings was Charles Darwin. And in that channel, he built the inspiration and the knowledge that brought him to develop the theory of evolution, another remarkable revolution in the way we look at the world and in the way we see science, whether you like it or not. So, with, we went uh, to, that is the Magellan Straits. And that is a mountain, like many. And uh, we went on top, uh, Sandy and I, on top of uh, this Mount Tarn, which is a mount like many, but it was very special. And it was very special because next to us, one seated on the right and one seated on the left, there was Ferdinand Mangelan and Charles Darwin with us. We climbed this mountain after reading Darwin's attempt to go on top of it in order to get a better look. And the trouble that he has going through the bushes. He didn't mention anything about the river for him, but that's, a, <laughs> that's another story. Or Mangelan. This, uh, we're standing on the northern shore, and uh, in front, in, in the back, there is the south shore of uh, the Straits. And there they taught, you, you, look at, you, you look at the body of water and you, and you think about the sheep passing by, and they taught that that was not part of the human world. That that was the land, the Finnish territory. That was a land where monsters and God uh, inhabited. And they never land on the south shore because it was not for humans. And you're sitting there and, you, and you're looking at the same scene and you really feel how remarkable it would have been to be on that ship and what would have might have felt one of these mariners looking directly into another world. I feel like, like the, 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 the New Zealand movies, uh, like Lord of the Rings, like this. Uh, Charles, um, another thing that going through uh, Charles Chardas' Char book uh, is his uh, focus on nature and his uh, focus on cultural diversity. He was not very successful in his observations on cultural diversity, but more so in the one of nature. And that helps you to read more and inform uh, your spirit and prepare yourself for meeting the incredible nature that you see in, uh, in Patagonia to understand that maybe even in nothingness there is something that uh, a pristine forest look like this and not like this and so that the reforestation attempts they don't quite put the things back in the same condition that uh, when they took the trees uh, down and uh, we went uh, also to a very touristic site but it's also a very remarkable place which is the Perito Moreno Glacier and it's beautiful, and I urge you, all of you of doing it. But we find, we, I had a problem with it, and this is the problem that I had. Everywhere there are these signs. Peligro, dangerous. Can you believe it? Since 1988, 32 people died because they tried to approach the glacier. 32 people since 1988. That's normally the amount of uh, uh, people dying in the Italian highway on a uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> so the problem with this is that it creates, it instills little by little a, a culture whereby nature is dangerous. And instead, Queen's Road is, is safe. <laughs> there is also this platform built along. And so basically, you arrive there in your own car or in a bus, and you step into the tarmac of a huge parking lot, and you go into the steel of this walkway, always above the ground, and then you're back into the tarmac of the parking lot, and back into the car or bus, and you drive home. And this is supposedly, if you look at National Geographic, is one of the 10 experiences, the best 10 experiences of nature. And you never even touch it, you never even feel it. Uh, 
So Darwin was not a good informer for meeting uh, local people, but uh, Ferdinando Coanes, a Chilean uh, uh, novelist, uh, is, and is remarkable in, uh, with his uh, characters in making you feel what it means for the local man and they, uh, in his times were adventurers, fortune seekers, mariners, sea freighters, captains, anarchists that move in, in, into this desolate land and what it meant to live there in these huge spaces, the solitude that they felt. And, uh, and that's quite remarkable when you, when you approach it, when, when you get there and you have the same feelings, you, you see the same, even if there is the one right in front of you, you see the same people walking there in that landscape. And there was a, 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 one of my favorite characters are these angels that walk on the bottom of the, the walk on the bottom of the sea near the island of Chiloé in, in, in Chile. And they have this, uh, so this angel are fishermen. They are muscle divers. They, they wear this rubber white suit and they go down into the sea to collect hand by hand the muscle only hanging to their life in the very small tube, very small tube uh, that is operated without compressor on a boat by normally their wife. So if you read, read other stories about Kolani, you know that these guys normally spend the night with their mates at the local ta tavern and they come back home totally drunk. So the wife gets very upset. So imagine that they after the wife still upset and has to breathe you down and make, make sure that uh, all the air goes there and she doesn't just turn it off for 10 seconds to remind you <laughs> what not to do it in, in, the, in the evening. And, and uh, the beautiful thing was to find that uh, some of these men are still there and to meet Gustavos and share with him how exciting you were reading about his stories. And of course he invites you over for, to the same tavern and drink and then the wife arrives and they get upset but then you manage to, to make her happy again and to join uh, drinking with you. And actually, this is how, instead of the majority, there's still some Gustavos, but the majority of people do it in, in this way. Um, I want to skip through um, and arrive to the end, because I'm using all, all, all my time. So you see the Sugo cooking, cooking and rehearsing doesn't work too well. This is the adventure that we do, hike out of, the, of any trails to reach the end of the world and back. And uh, the very last things I would like to share with you is that, by chance, we thought that that was the climax of our trip, but it, but it wasn't. The climax of our trip happened when we did something unexpected. And basically, we took, because we needed petrol, we were in desperate need of petrol, we abandoned what we, the, the road that we were traveling went to another road. 300 kilometers of beautiful nature where there was nobody, which is a remarkable thing in our times because everywhere has become crowded and even the ultimate adventure, Mount Everest, has become nothing more than South Beach on a, on a Sunday. <laughs> I'm not kidding, these are the Hillary steps at 7,500 meters that you have to wait for the Italians that are chitty chatting on the top so. <laughs> or somebody sending Instagrams uh, photographs uh. <laughs> but basically we were driving on this road we stopped a car we looked at the remarkable uh, we are remarkable mountains and we walk and we decided it looks easy enough to walk on top of it and that we, is what we, we did and that moment was a moment of joy and a moment of happiness because we left off the book behind. We wrote our own pages and we find in this meaningless speak a little bit of meaning but for sure a lot of happiness. So happy travel.